Uh, I hadn't heard that Mentos one before. That's, uh, I'll keep that in mind. Uh, enough of this talk about the future. Uh, I thought I'd talk about the past for a second. Um, imagine uh, the situation around 1930, 31, 32, when national alcohol prohibition had proven itself to be a failed policy. Uh, the 21st Amendment, which was going to usher in repeal of alcohol prohibition, uh, didn't, uh, it, it got rid of the national prohibition, but it gave the states the opportunity to uh, regulate alcohol. And of course, the states were interested in, in thinking about desirable ways that they would want to regulate alcohol in the absence of the national prohibition. Um, an individual ended up, uh, a surprising individual played sort of a key role in helping to develop guidelines for how states should uh, regulate alcohol in the absence of national prohibition. That person was John D. Rockefeller, Jr. Uh, John D. Rockefeller's father, John D. Rockefeller, Jr.'s father, who would be uh, John D. Rockefeller, he uh, is perhaps best known as being the founder of the University of Chicago. His portrait hangs uh, in a hall down the, uh, just a little bit away from where we are right now. Uh, and, but he's also well known for being a lifelong abstainer from alcohol. He was a teetotaler. His, his son, John D. Rockefeller Jr., also was a lifelong uh, teetotaler. And furthermore, they financially supported the Anti-Saloon League, the interest group that was perhaps most uh, influential in bringing about national alcohol prohibition. Uh, despite this fact, John D. Rockefeller Jr., after he'd seen about 12 years of prohibition in action, he, uh, he changed his mind. He publicly changed his mind. He said, I now support repeal. And he decided to start supporting efforts to think about how we could regulate alcohol after national prohibition uh, went away. Um, and part of the results of what he did was this book. This is my, uh, I brought a prop, was this book. Uh, the, the foreword to this book is written by John D. Rockefeller, Jr. Uh, and the reason he changed his mind, he tells us why he changed his mind, is because he saw all of the violence, all of the lawlessness that came with prohibition. And he said, you know, I'm all in favor of abstinence, both socially and personally, but abstinence, trying to achieve abstinence through the law is a mistake. Uh, the book is written by uh, Raymond Fosdick and Albert Scott, and they, it turned out to be very influential. A lot of states used the suggestions that uh, Fosdick and Scott had. Um, I want to, the, the title of the book is itself interesting, at least to me. The title of the book is Toward Liquor Control. It was published during Prohibition. There were still a couple months of Prohibition to go. Toward Liquor Control. The, the implicit message is liquor was not controlled during Prohibition. The manufacture and sale of alcohol had been illegal for more than 13 years when this book was published, but this book is titled Toward Liquor Control. It was going to take legalization and regulation to control liquor. Okay, well, that's the, uh, that's the glimpse to the past. Right now we have, of course, a, uh, a prohibition on drugs. Uh, and now it has revealed itself to be a failed policy, and people want to know what will happen after the, na the national prohibition, in fact, global prohibition of drugs go, go, goes away. Now, you might say, what do you mean it's revealed itself to be a failed policy? You might disagree. And if you disagree, I'm not going to, uh, my, the purpose of today's talk is not to convince you that it's failed, but I am going to talk about alternatives to prohibition, alternatives that I think will be better than prohibition, and if you're a prohibitionist, presumably you'll, you'll feel differently. Um, but imagine for a second that I'll go back to the past. We'll go back to 1914. The prohibition of opiates and cocaine in the United States essentially got started when the Harrison Act was passed in 1914. The national prohibition on marijuana came a bit later in 1937. Uh, imagine you're, you're going to have some discussion about drug policy, and someone says, you know, we have this problem. We have, um, you can buy cocaine and opium and morphine and heroin perfectly legally, and in fact, without any sort of impediments. You can just buy it and uh, consume it in all sorts of ways. And uh, many Americans consume these drugs. And, well, most of them do it responsibly, but there's a small percentage of people, one or two percent, who really get into trouble with these drugs, get into trouble in a big way. They have self-control problems, and, and the one or two percent of Americans turn into full-blown addicts, and they ruin their lives, they ruin the lives of people around them uh, through their misuse of these drugs, and sometimes, under the influence of these drugs, they behave badly and directly harm other people. So maybe we should make this stuff illegal, if we make it illegal, it will deter people from using these drugs and we'll be able to, to, to reduce the amount of addiction. Well, okay, that's a reasonable argument. Now, imagine someone who, from the point of view of 2011, 
gets up and, 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 and talks about prohibition, responds as the interlocutor in this debate. And what would the response be? The response would be, yeah, you know, you're right. We could offer some deterrence to people getting in trouble with drugs by making these drugs illegal, but we'll have to pass these laws. And if we pass these laws, we're going to have to put some people in prison because some people are going to break these laws. And yeah, it might just be a handful of people, but what if it were, oh, at any one time, something like half a million Americans were in prison and jail for drug law violations? Does it still make sense? What if a majority of the prisoners in the federal prison system in the United States would be there for drug law violations? What if year after year after year, the most common reason to be arrested in the United States was a drug law violation, with 80% of those arrests being for mere possession? What if more than 2,000 Americans a day were being arrested for possession of marijuana? And what if while we're doing this and arresting and putting, imprisoning all these people, we're undermining the, govern, govern, the governing structures in source and transit countries and we're losing thousands of people being murdered in Mexico, even tens of thousands being murdered in Mexico. And our own black markets in inner cities are incredibly violent. And furthermore, children are being recruited not just to buy drugs, but to sell drugs in, in these black markets in our own cities. And, and when we do all this and we have these, these consequences, we're still going to have 1 or 2% of our population having self-control problems and being addicted to these drugs. And their, their situation is actually going to be worse because enforcement is going, to, is going to move them away from the less potent forms of those drugs, like opium, toward, and, and maybe drinking opium, to more potent versions, heroin, and injecting it. And, and their situation is also going to be worse because they're not going to know the potency or the quality of this black market produced drug. So we're going to see an increase in accidental overdoses and poisonings. Well, if somebody would have said that in 1914 to a person who was suggesting prohibition, I think, I think the person who would have suggested it would have said, whoa, whoa, yeah, I want to cut back on addiction problems, but I don't want any part of this. You know, we want no part of it. Well, that would have been the right, well, first they wouldn't have believed that that would have been the out outcome, but had they thought that was a credible outcome, the outcome that we have, that uh, they certainly would have been against prohibition. And uh, as it was then, so it should be now. Uh, we should be against prohibition. So, what's, what is the in intended effect of prohibition? It is we want to raise the effective price of these drugs so that we can decrease the quantity demanded and quantity consumed. That's the intended effect of prohibition. Everything else that we just talked about, the violence, the arrests, the prison, the corruption, all of that is an unintended consequence of prohibition. And furthermore, not just unintended, but highly socially costly, highly undesirable. Right? Wouldn't it be possible for us to find alternatives where we can get some of this intended effect without these really costly side effects? And I think the answer is yes. So, so what are the alternatives? Well, there's one alternative, of course, that immediately comes to mind because it it's already uh, exists, and that's the alcohol alternative. So what's the alcohol alternative? The alcohol alternative is a minimum age of purchase, and state-licensed stores or government monopoly stores, those, by the way, were the Fosdick and Scott suggestions for alcohol control in the states. Uh, state-licensed stores or uh, uh, government monopoly stores. And we're going to have taxes. We're going to have special taxes, like sin taxes, if you like, on alcohol. And furthermore, we can use the tax structure to try to push people away from the really potent forms of the drugs, uh, distilled alcohol in the case of alcohol, towards the less potent forms, beer and wine. So we can do that with drugs the currently illegal drugs, we can use the alcohol system. And I have to say, I, I won't be surprised if you find that that doesn't inspire a lot of confidence in you, because it doesn't inspire a lot of confidence in me. In fact, for me, it doesn't even inspire a lot of confidence with respect to alcohol. But, but, but surely with respect to particularly the hard drugs that are currently prohibited, I don't think that's going to work very well. Now, what's the next thing we can add to the alcohol, the alcohol regulatory structure that might move us in a more de desirable direction? The next thing we can add is exclusion possibilities. And uh, what do I mean by exclusion possibilities? People can, we work under the alcohol system, people who are old enough can buy, can buy these drugs, but if you misuse that drug, or you behave badly under the influence of that drug, you will lose your right to, consume, to purchase and consume that drug, and you will lose that right in an enforceable way. Now, surprisingly, in a sense, we have not used exclusion that much in alcohol in the past. 
we are, uh, we are using it more thanks to uh, innovations with respect to technology and with respect to policy. So if we now have those uh, ankle bracelets, I won't show you mine, the ankle bracelets uh, <laughs> that are alcohol monitors. Uh, and we, uh, we have something like South Dakota's 24-7 sobriety program, where some, an alcohol offender is, is effectively kept away from consuming alcohol. Okay, so we can do that with alcohol, we can do that with drugs if we want to. So we, can, we can set up mandatory exclusions for people who, who uh, misbehave under the influence of, of drugs. Um, but, you know, it's, we don't need to just have the mandated version, right? Nobody wants to be a drug addict. Nobody wants to be a drug addict. So there's a lot of incentive for people to avoid becoming addicts. So we can also set up voluntary exclusion systems where people remove the right for them to consume their drug of choice. Okay, and here we have this, this works, well, we already have working examples of this, and the working examples of this exist with respect to gambling regulation. So casinos and, and regulatory jurisdictions have set up so-called self-exclusion systems. And what are the self-exclusion systems? You put your name on the list, they take your picture, you are no longer allowed into the casino. If you go to the casino, you will be arrested and charged with trespassing in many jurisdictions. And, and uh, if you sneak in, in the US, if you sneak in and you manage to gamble anyway, when you win that big jackpot, you'll have to fill out federal forms for tax purposes, yay, yeah, tax law, and you will not be able to collect that jackpot. Self-exclusion works really well for people who sign up for it. Many of the people who sign up for it move to total abstinence from gambling. The people who sign up for it are, are, have terrible gambling problems. They're pathological or problem gamblers. They sign up for self-exclusion. Some of them become abstinent. Some of them remain gambling, but the quality of their gambling problems goes, well, the quality of their, their, their life goes up. The quality of the problems goes down. I don't know. Quality does something. Okay? It's, it's, it's great for them. It, Missouri has the first statewide program in the U.S., and, and uh, they set it up in the mid to late 90s, and now there are 15,000 people who have signed up for a lifetime ban from going to one, any of Missouri's 13 riverboat casinos. It's a pretty amazing thing. Anyway, so we could do that with drugs, too. People who are afraid of their own, of, of their own addictive or self-control problems can put themselves on an, an exclusion list, and we can enforce it. Not perfectly, but we can enforce it. Okay, well, you know, I think that might work pretty well for some of the softer drugs, but still I have to say, I'm a little concerned. There are those drugs, you just mention the name and people, I mean, they, 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 they bring fear into your life. Methamphetamine, crack, uh, heroin. These things are scary things. And I think we can go further uh, along the lines of control uh, in the case of these drugs. So beyond uh, the alcohol regime plus exclusion possibilities. The next thing we can do is we can change, the, change it from an opt-out system, which exclusion gives us, to an opt-in system. So right now, when you turn 21 years old, you can buy alcohol in the United States. In fact, you can buy all the alcohol you can afford. But when you turn 16, you're old enough to drive, but you can't drive legally on public roads until you get a license. And to get that license, you have to pass a test. And that test, you're going to have to demonstrate that you have uh, some ability, limited admittedly, to operate a car in a safe fashion and, uh, and that you understand the rules of the road. So we can do that with drugs. We can say, okay, when you turn 21, if you want to, you can apply for the privilege of purchasing even these hard drugs. And we'll have the, the licensing system. We'll have a lot. That for this licensing system, we can do a lot to try to push you in the direction of safer use. You have to show that you understand uh, that how, to, how to use these drugs safely, what to do in the event of overdose, what the rules are about where you can consume it, all that sort of stuff. So you can have the, that sort of test. You can have an advanced purchase requirement. Three days, you have to order your drugs three days in advance to try to cut back on impulsive consumption of drugs. Uh, you can, what else can you do with the, the licensing system? Anyway, there's all sorts of things you can do. There's, you revoke, of course, the license of anyone who, um, uh, who misbehaves. You allow people to, to specify their own limits. There will be regulatory limits, of course, to limit uh, the opportunity for people to, to sell the stuff in the secondary market. But uh, you, people can choose. How much of the drug am I going to allow myself to buy in a day, a week, a month? By the way, there's some, there's some gambling that happens in, in some gambling jurisdictions now. So the self-limitation thing. Well, anyway, I, I just wanted to uh, sort of run those by you. Um, 
the, what should replace, I'll, I'll re-ask the Fosdick and Scott question, the John D. Rockefeller Jr. question, what should replace national drug prohibition instead of alcohol prohibition, drug prohibition? And I think that uh, the answer is for our, the soft drugs, the relatively soft of our currently prohibited drugs, I think uh, an alcohol style system with uh, exclusion possibilities would work okay. And for the harder drugs, I think you want full on buyer licensing. Now, I am, um, with respect to the details of this system, uh, well, which I haven't given actually, <laughs> but I'm, but I'm, what I want to point out is I'm, I may well be wrong, and you probably think I'm wrong. And with respect to the details of this system, I am surely wrong. Uh, but uh, that's no reason not to experiment with, with a system like this. We can, uh, and, and by the way, if you want to see a little more detail, you can go, there's a UK Drugs Policy Foundation called Transform, which on a drug by drug basis lays out some ways to regulate drugs and, and signs on with a lot of buyer licensing in, in, uh, in the case of some of the harder drugs. Um, we know what we get with drug prohibition. What we get with drug prohibition is not just the intended consequence, it's all those unintended consequences. They are unintended, but they are perfectly foreseeable. You can't support prohibition, the trying to keep people away from drugs, without simultaneously supporting these other problems. They are part and parcel. We can change it at the margins, but in the pro pro prohibition regime, if you support prohibition, you're supporting the prisons, you're supporting the arrests, you're supporting the violence, and you're supporting the corruption. We know what we get with prohibition. We can do better with a legal regime that will move us, and I'll just go back to John D. Rockefeller. John D. Rockefeller thought we could move away from a lawless regime to something better, and I think we can move away from a pro prohibition regime to a legal regime with regulation that will move us toward drug control. Thank you.